We are currently in the UCF Biology Building, and we're really excited to show you around campus and a couple of our awesome academic buildings and services that we have for our students. First up is our bug closet. Hello, I'm Vicki with the Bug Closet. I'm the current outreach coordinator. Um, if you're ever strolling through the first floor of the biology building, you'll find this cool set of bug displays behind me um, and somewhere down there. Uh, and then we also have some cool research information on the outside you can check out. Uh, but we keep out these displays so that people can see what bugs look like naturally um, up close and personal rather than having to look up YouTube videos or Google images of what they look like. Um, so if we come inside, we can see why the bug closet is called the bug closet. Uh, it started off as a storage unit, a little broom closet, up until someone, Stuart Fullerton, came in and changed our lives for the better. Um, he was our main provider for money in order to bring all these specimens in. Uh, these are little specimens that students are currently working on. Um, we have something called BioBlitz where we go out and bring volunteers, um, such as students who are volunteering here, um, to collect different specimens and just measure out the biodiversity of that area that we're collecting for the BioBlitz. Um, I'm not sure if these are BioBlitz, um, but we do have a project where it's just bees somewhere under here or maybe upstairs. Um, and that girl is currently making a bee based on what she's found um, so that other scientists around the world can use that bee key to identify bees native to their area. All right, so if we bring it along, we can check out this poster right here. These are all wasps um, blown up pretty much. So their actual size is to the bottom left-hand corner of them. And I like to point out this bad boy because that is the smallest wasp and I believe in North America, it's called the fairy wasp. And it's so, so small that it's capable of basically swimming through the air and barely having to flap their wings because it, they don't need much surface area in order to do so, they're just so tiny. And they have little hairs and filaments on top of the wings. So we can go and look over here, it's expanded. So we have the money in order to store all these specimens and have all this ethanol in order to store it, a cool freezer so that we can freeze bugs whenever we get them and then pin later. Um, first specimen I'm gonna show you is the longest bug in North America, which is this big old walking stick. This one right here specifically. I like to show that one because he's a record breaker. He's a long boy. And then, I don't know if any one of you have seen a cicada in real life, but these are the guys that scream in your trees in the heat of the summer. If you wanted to see what they actually look like, they're pretty big. And they stridulate, so they make noise with their wings rubbing up against each other to make that screaming noise. They're pretty cool. Um, They'll come out at weird prime numbers of years. So some cicadas will stay under the ground for seven years, some for nine, some for like 15. And then they'll come out and start screaming. And that's how you know when they've come out. All right, um, I'll show you one thing in this cabinet. You can come around because it'll open up this way. But it's called a cicada killer. So I just showed you the cicadas. cicadas. Um, these are what hunts and kills for the cicadas. They're big old wasps in the family Crebronidae. <laughs> They're really big. If you can't get a good measure on Zoom right now or whatever live this is, it's about as big as your entire thumb. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'll put those bad boys back. And let's move on to some beetles. All right, so the order of beetles is Coleoptera, and the order of ants, bees, and wasps is Hymenoptera. Both of these orders are very large and expansive and compete to be the largest orders of bugs. So if we look here, 
Um, I don't know if any one of you have heard of what a weevil is, but I think they're really cute and I like to point them out first because they have little noses. Little snouts. These are actually the largest weevils in North America. It's the palm weevil, North American palm weevil. We did get a quick question. And yeah. Someone had asked if anyone is allowed in the bug closet or is it only biology students? So um, are you talking about visiting or volunteering? Um, because anybody can volunteer and anyone can visit as long as, as it's either a scheduled tour um, via email or calling, or if it's just a couple people walking in and saying, oh, hey, can I just check it out? Or can someone show me around real quick? Yeah, um, but if it's about, you know, five or 10, five to 10 or more students and they all come in and say, oh, let's get a tour, we're probably not gonna accept it because it's a really small, tight space, a place we didn't allow a lot of people even before COVID. So if we move on over, I can show you a different beetle in the family Bee Press today. They're very shiny, um, and you can actually find these guys here. A lot, most of these are native insects. And they're very metallic in color. Um, so if you look at that guy, he probably has the most metallic coloring in this whole box, or these guys. Um, but they're wood boring beetles. So they lay eggs in trees, um, and they're really quick. So if you ever see one on a tree and you try to catch it, they'll just be like, really quickly away from you. All right, so this is a little separate room where people can grab a microscope and study their own thing, whatever they want to identify or just look closer at or maybe even practice their taxonomy. We have this fridge here to bring in specimens um, that are freshly collected so that they have time to become frozen as that is the most ethical way to kill insects or you can put them in ethanol um, and then use them for later. We have this cool fancy camera right here that's able to take pictures of insects really close up. Um, they look kind of like these, for example. But we use these so that we can send them over to other scientists or let students see them so that it's an even more close up view of what they look like out in nature. All right, so if I pop out here, I can show you an outreach box that we typically use for the Entomological Society of Central Florida, which is our on-campus bug club. Um, I can start off here. We normally take these to like real outreach places like Orlando Science Center or Lou Gardens and whatnot. But as COVID has approached us, we no longer attend those special occasions anymore. I like to bring out the Lepidopterans. Lepidoptera is the order of butterflies and moths um, because most people know what butterflies and moths are. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, so I have comparisons here, color comparisons. Um, this is what happens to this moth when it's left in fluorescent lighting for too long. So it becomes bleached. Uh, moths butterflies and skippers have little scales on them which allow them to have the color that they do and the scales become bleached if too much light has been brought upon them or light from the sun so it's pretty cool to see that comparison and then this is our main deal the one where it's not just native butterflies and moths and beetles it's from around the world so people frequently donate insects to us, um, just so we know what things look like outside the realm of North America as well. And I like to point out this guy first and then go around. Um, it's actually the same species, just flipped over. It's called a Chinese leaf butterfly. And it's supposed to look exactly like a leaf underneath. And I think that's really cool considering when butterflies rest, they rest with their, they mostly rest with their wings close. So when this guy rests, he's perfectly camouflaged. Um, we've got some giant beetles over here. Um, I like to point out this violin beetle, which is the brown one, capable of hiding itself in really small crevices. Um, and those are technically the elytra, which is the 
upper part of the wings, but it's not capable of flying. So there is a trade-off with having thin, fat wings like that. <laughs> this guy right here is the Goliath beetle, the largest beetle known to man. So we have a real record breaker in the bug closet. Um, they're typically found as pets in Asia. I personally want a pet like that. <laughs> I think I could take care of it. Um, people like to point this guy out because they think it's a bug, but it's actually a brooch made out of tortoise beetles. So people like to wear bug jewelry around the, around the world. Uh, a second question come in. Mm -hmm. Someone asked, what are some examples of what you study with the bugs? Of what I study personally, um, I study like the taxonomy. So if I'm given a box of wasps, which I have been recently, um, I can use something called a dichotomous key. Um, and it'll show you different couplets of descriptions of what a bug might look like. And if that description matches your specimen in front of you in, in the microscope, you go to the next number up until you find out exactly what your specimen is. So that's how you do it. That's how you find out what bug is each bug. All right. And then last but not least in this box, the cool butterflies. Um, I like to focus on this one because most people know what a blue morpho butterfly is, um, but they do not know that that coloration is not really there. So usually when you see blue out in nature, it's not really blue. It's actually the light refra refracting off of the structure of the scales back into your eyes to make it look as if it were blue. When really, it's more of a brown color. It looks very brown on the back. Yeah. So those are our outreach boxes. If we bring it over a little bit more, we have a gas chamber over here where we can set ethanol and make sure nobody breathes in ethanol fumes. Um, but something really cool about this place is that it used to have a whole bunch more kinds of specimens that were not insects. Um, currently we have some fish and skeleton or skulls and things back there, but we used to have a bunch of birds and little library slide out drawers, which are currently in the research lab now on Gemini Boulevard, I think. I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, we can check those out. And I like to show people these things as well outside of bugs because it's, it still falls into the realm of you know, taxonomy and knowing what things are and knowing what they look like out in person. You can still send these out to different labs for them to look at. And it's, it, ha it holds important scientific value. And that's the main reason they're in here. Even the fish are just perfectly preserved, so you can just see all the different features of them. Yeah, and then we have some equipment here that's great for catching insects. So we have uh, just standard butterfly nets that you can use to, you know, infinity swoop it in the air and catch something like a dragonfly. Or we have dip nets which can be used in ponds, on the shores of ponds, and you can get aquatic insects as well. All right. Um, so I think that just about wraps it up if we don't have any more questions. Um, but I think it's a very worthy place to check out if you're a new student or a student who just hasn't known about this place. Um, so uh, I think that's it for me. <laughs> All right. Hi everybody, my name is Katie Miller and I am the department head for student learning and engagement here at UCF Libraries. And I'm here to kick off your tour. So first, we're at the student union entrance. Um, it's right in the heart of campus. And you might wonder as you pass by, what is this big building on the side of the new addition? Well, the brick sections, they hold what we call the ARC or the Automatic Retrieval Center. That is where we store all the books so that we can make all the study spaces that we're gonna show you here today. And then if you look up at the top, see those long skinny windows? We're gonna start up there on the fourth floor so you can see the reading room, one of the showcases of our new edition. So 
let's go ahead and get started. As we walk in, we're going to pass by the circulation desk. That's where you pick up your books from the ark or checkout books that you find on the shelves that are intersprinkled throughout the floors. We're going to start up on the fourth floor, but we're going to take this stairwell. So I wanted to take a moment here and show you here's the student union. You can see the student union entrance. So we are definitely in the heart of campus. We're going up the stairs. We do have elevators, but we thought this would be more interesting. <laughs> so we're gonna take a little break here on the third floor. And I wanted to let you know that David Benjamin is going to give you the tour of the fourth floor. So as I said, we're going to start up at the top and work our way down. David is the head of our special collections and university archives. And I like to think he gets to be in charge of all the cool and interesting things in our collection. Hi, David. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm David Benjamin, head of special collections and university archives. We're actually not quite at the fourth floor. We're going to talk a little about it here because the fourth floor is a quiet floor and there are students in there currently studying. So I'm about to let, take you through the new, this is all new space on that fourth floor. There are three main areas here. There is a multi-purpose room, which we'll just walk by today. We won't actually go in there. There's a new exhibit gallery, which we'll go in there and talk a little further. And then there's our new brand new reading room, amazing tall ceilings and great places to sit, lots of choices for seating. One thing to remember, we're going to see a lot of furniture roped off. It's because of COVID-19 precautions. That's what it is. So let's go ahead and head up. Again, we're about to enter the new fourth floor space. This is the multi-purpose room. And then the rest of the floor is mostly for study space. Welcome to the new gallery space. This just opened in January. This is where we can display really great things from our collection. This, the current exhibit is 45 years of collecting. It looks at the history of special collections the University Archives and the materials they've collected over the years. Everything from a 13th century Gregorian chant to, in this case, a UCF championship ring and a squishy, what they call a squishy nitro. You all may have heard of Spirit Splash and the Spirit Splash Ducks, which we have one in here. Before the ducks, there was this squishy nitro, highly collectible. We just found out about this a few weeks, about a month and a half ago from some alumni. In addition, there's a football sign by Dante Culpepper, and other stuff about the UCF and UCF sports. University Archives is charged with telling the, the official history of the University of Central Florida, so that's why we have this stuff. Next, we're going to head into the reading room. This is a brand new space. I'm not going to say much when we get, I probably won't say anything when we get in there because there's a number of students studying there and it is a quiet space. But this gives you a chance to look around. The view is phenomenal. And we also have a few exhibit cases in there. One of them has Vinnie the Vulture and I'll tell a little bit about Vinnie as we head back down the stairs in a minute. So let's go into the reading room.
plug back downstairs now. Just a little bit about venting as we go down. Uh, the 1969, there's a cartoon in the future, which was a student news newspaper at the time, about Vinny the Vulture. It was one of the vultures on campus. And it was, people wanted to make it our mascot because they said it would um, bring fear to our opponents. I'm not quite sure if that's true or not. So this vulture was very popular on campus. And when he passed, they had it taxidermied. And it used to sit in the university's administrative offices. Eventually, it's made its way over to special collections of the University Archives, where it now it's housed. Currently, we're on the third floor. Just peek in here. It's a little, a little less quiet than normally. Today, it's a little quiet. But all different kinds of seating on this floor, places for people to collaborate. The library has 20, about 2,800 seats. 29 study rooms, 300 computers, so we've got you covered whatever you need, all different types of seating, that's what I like. You'll find something that's comfortable, whether it be a sofa, a high back chair, a, just a traditional table, you'll find it here, and it is a great place to study, and that fifth floor, fourth floor study room, excuse me, the fourth floor study room is really a great place. There's one floor we won't see today, we have a fifth floor study room, it's perfectly silent. You make any noise and you're going to get in trouble from the other students. Because it's an awesome place to study, and it also has phenomenal views of campus. So we're going to turn it over to Penny, who's going to show you the rest of the second floor here. Thanks for joining me, and go Knights. Thank you. Thank you, David. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think David and Katie have shown you a lot of the high points so far of the library. We're going to go ahead and take a really quick turnabout on the second floor, which is our main floor. And so it has all the service desks. So let's just take a walk down this way. Uh, I heard David say that pretty much we've got you covered no matter what your uh, study needs are, and he's absolutely right. So the further up you go, the quieter it is. As you move further south or you know, to the first and second floor, those are our collaboration areas. Right now we've got some COVID protocols set up, so you don't see as many people studying in teams and groups. Um, but come this fall, we expect to be back to face-to-face, -face, fairly normal operations. And so we'll be back to our regular 105 hours per week. And you see a few students here now. It's a little bit later in the day, but uh, this place is packed. So whenever you come to UCF, make sure and get here early and stake your place out. And again, on this floor, one of the things we're going to show you is a cafe. So when you come in, you can actually grab a cup of coffee or a smoothie bagel or whatnot, and uh, just kind of settle in for the day or as long as you want to. Exhibit hall here. And you may have heard that you know, as we renovate the library, we're going to do it floor by floor. So we're about halfway through. We added a bunch of new space, that automated retrieval center, which if you haven't seen the video yet, you've got to see it. It's really cool. And then third floor is next, and I'm going to renovate the second floor. So here's our cafe, Java City. And it's open uh, pretty extended hours. Lots of study spaces in here. During normal times, you'll find like um, groups in here, a lot of board games, uh, chess and checkers, all set up in here. And this is a really popular site here. It's our LibTech tech lending desk. And you can take a look at this block sign and you can see some of the things they check out here. Um, the very nice people here will also help you set up your Wi-Fi and kind of uh, address a lot of tech questions. Check us out um, also online. Just go to the library website and you can see a full listing of everything that they have to circulate here as well. This next uh, desk is our research and information desk. We call it the RAID. And it's staffed with librarians. It's, um, again, has very extended hours. We also have online and virtual hours as well. And every student at UCF has their own librarian. So it doesn't matter 
this Narnia? <laughs> Hi. Right now we have a we Hi. telereference, kind of like a telemedicine. Um, I call it librarian in box, but <laughs> just kidding. You can walk up and ask us any kinds of questions, like research questions, how do I find books, how do I find articles, I need a data set, how do I cite something? And then if you need to, um, if you have a biology specific question, then you're welcome to uh, talk to your biology librarian. Again, every library, every student has their own librarian. And now we're just going to like take a circle around this floor and we're going to end up back at the circulation desk where you came in. So if you ask for a book from the Automated Retrieval Center or the ARC, you can come back over here to the circulation desk and pick it up. Uh, if you find a book in the stacks, you can pick it up. And then we also have a lot of textbooks here. And that's um, an initiative that we're really interested in supporting for student success. So if there's a book that's fairly expensive and it might take a while for your uh, financial aid to come in or something like that, we try to have that book here so you can not fall behind. And we also have a lot of electronic books that are free to students too that are actually being used for course textbooks. David, is there anything else you want to add about this part of the floor? Do you talk about like the new books area? Or anything yeah, like that? You do that. Okay, we'll talk about that. <laughs> His favorite part. <laughs> I'll walk backwards this time because there's no stairs involved, but I'll probably still trip and fall. <laughs> this is our new book area. This is where you can see the new books that are acquired by the library. The other area, which is around the corner, we didn't see it. We have some places that have books designed for free reading, novels, biographies, things that aren't necessarily related to your schoolwork. But we feel it's really important to sometimes let your brain relax a little. I know I used to, when I was studying years and years and decades ago, I'd often say, I just need to read a book where I can forget that no one's going to quiz me. If I forget a major plot point, I'm not going to fail anything. I just did it for free reading. And that really helped to often reset my brain. It was really great. So we have that as well. That's a whole rotating um, series of books that comes and goes. So it's a great place to find a novel, to sneak away and read. So think about that when you're here. Um, then Yes, Penny. Glowforge. How about the Glowforge and 3D printer? Oh, you talk about that. I'm, I'm, that's new to me. <laughs> okay. Our students uh, actually fund a lot of our tech. They fund what we call tech fee requests. And we've gotten millions, literally millions of dollars from students who funded these things. And most recently, we got uh, a Glowforge, which is a laser cutter. And we've got a 3D printer. And we're getting two more 3D printers. So again, like, it doesn't matter whether in humanities, sciences, social sciences, students are finding many really creative ways to use these uh, machines and technology, both for their personal, you know, um, whatever they want to do personally or for their uh, schoolwork. So with those, that's in a branch campus. And we also have three branch campuses and we have relationships with like half a dozen other schools around here. So Penny, before we wrap up, I have one question for you and thank you to you, David, Katie, you've all been fantastic. Um, talk a little bit or real quickly about the role of librarians in helping students be academically successful at UCF. Uh, great question. I feel like the library is as invested as the faculty and any other campus you can get on um, here on site. We work really closely with our partners like Burnett Honors College, uh, International Student Associations, and we do a lot of events and programming workshops to help build study skills, as well as connect you to the information that you need to write your papers and do research. So we, we feel like um, we're, we're your pocket librarian, you know, just pull us out and use us when you need us. This Sounds good. <clears throat> we have a beautiful facility here. Thank you again both so very much for the tour. We are going to head over to Zach and Elizabeth, who are in the College of Engineering. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining us in the library. Thank you. Thanks. We look forward to seeing you here. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Zach. I am currently a junior here studying civil engineering. Now, where we are right now, this is actually our structures lab. It is part of the College of Engineering and Computer Science, which falls under the Civil, Environmental, and Construction Engineering cluster. So there's a lot of different things behind me right now, but one big thing I do want to showcase is right over here to my right hand side. Uh, this is actually a bleacher structure that we have set up, and it is actually from our football stadium, which is known as the Bounce House. 
So what we've done here is we've actually hooked it up to a bunch of different sensors. So throughout games, we've been able to track and see how our stadium is actually moving and deflecting. Uh, so it's really cool. It's a great way to actually analyze some data. And it has a timestamp on it. So it's a lot of fun to be able to go back, watch, and see where maybe we scored a touchdown. The stadium moved a little bit more than when we got a first down. So this is just kind of a testing setup that we do have from what we did do on a game stadium uh, test. And the last thing I'm going to quickly talk about over here is right to my left. This is a universal testing machine. So this is where we can test a bunch of different material. Uh, we test a lot of different pieces of equipment, sort of like this little piece of steel or aluminum. Uh, so this is what's known as a coupon. It is just a small piece of an aluminum I-beam that we can put under different stresses, strains, and things like that. Uh, and we're able to test it, and we're able to get all of the, uh, all of the data compiled up onto all of our computers right in through here. Uh, so it's just a little bit about what's going on in here and some of the equipment that you might use if you fall under a major very similar to mine. Uh, so as we are going to walk, I'm going to talk a little bit more about kind of what is happening right now in our civil engineering school, uh, just because that is my major. But ultimately, we are going to be walking over towards our innovation lab. Uh, so come on and let's take a walk. All right, so as you can see, we did just walk outside of our structures lab. Now, as we walk over towards the main atrium of our uh, engineering school, you're going to see a lot of different labs that we're going to pass by, things like our geotechnical engineering lab. We do have our hydraulics lab and a couple other labs that you will see along the way. Now, for myself, I am an out-of-state student, so I do uh, New England. I am from Northeast Connecticut. What you're looking at right now is the reason why I'm here at UCF. It is this engineering school. It is these different labs. Uh, it does offer so much more experience than any other classes or any other universities I have seen in the past. Uh, so that is why this has been such a great school for me. Uh, so as we're walking by, you're just going to see some labs on either side of us. And we are atrium, and you will be seeing our innovation lab. Now, on the walls, as we walk by, you are going to see some different research projects that have been published here by our students and faculty. Uh, so it's just kind of a nice way to see what everyone's up to here in the College of Engineering. So as we approach the atrium, you are going to see we have a lot of different companies and people that are posted up around our school. Now, the reason we have that is so many different partnerships, a bunch of different, different engineering companies, people like NASA, Disney, SpaceX, uh, TI, Blue Origin, people like that. Uh, so you will be able to see all of those published out here in our region. people who are going to help show us what's all about in the TI Innovation Lab. All right, I'm Melissa, and this is the TI Lab, if you just want to walk right in. Hi, I'm Luke. Um, so this is the TI Innovation Lab, and uh, we're going to each come in and work on projects, but we have a laser cutter and 3D printers. So on the table over here, we have some examples of what the laser cutter is going to do. So we have some engraving here of a map. Um, and it's just the city of Orlando that a student made uh, for one of their architecture projects. Then we have a happy anniversary sign that we made that a student wanted to cut out for a project. Over this way, we have some 3D printers that we use for different projects. So, right here, this is an example of our color 3D printer. Um, and it prints in CMYK. So any color you can think of, it can print. Um, and it also does different textures. So on this specific pebble here, it has carbon fiber, cloth, wood, and stone all on the same part. At the back side of our lab, we have soldering stations for students to come in and solder different electronics projects, whether that be for senior design 
or just the standard freshman class with little bitty ribbons. Parts. Students can come in and just use the tools for the day, whatever they need to get done for their personal projects. This is our back room, and here in the back room we have a CNC foam cut. This is used to make wings for aerospace teams uh, so that they can build their planes efficiently for senior design. Over here we have our laser cutter, um, and the laser cutter I showed earlier can engrave and cut. But it doesn't only do wood, it does plastics. As an example here, we were making a keyboard out of clear acrylic. We also teach students how to make laser cuts three-dimensional. So for a statics class, we had students take the laser cut wood and actually make it of it, and then measure the forces in it. The biggest project we've done so far is right up here, We've had students build a plane on a laser cutter. And for all of you Star Wars fans, over here we have some TIE Fighters that we laser cut and assembled. Up there we have one of the bridges we use for statics class. It's kind of a hands-on representation of how you can measure forces across trusses. If you want to follow him over there. In this back corner over here, we have two more of our 3D printers. Um, and these are our manufacturer grade 3D printers. Um, so you basically plug in the file and they come out perfect every time. And then the support material dissolves away. So there's no guessing and checking with parts. You just plug them in and they work every time. We're going to go to the machine lab. Anyone from any major can come in and work. This one you would have to get strict permission to be able to work inside the lab. This is due to the machinery and you don't want to lose some fingers and you don't want to be playing on machines that you don't want to have to. This lab mainly works with metal. So they do a lot of CNC stuff, um, making different parts for different clubs. So you can see these are manual mills. When the machines are running, you have to have safety goggles on just to be 100% safe. Okay, so this is circular or like cones. There's a lot of aerospace students that come in here and they'll make nose cones for their rocket out of aluminum 
because that's what this machine's meant to do. It can be operated manually or by CNC control. So if you want to get the practice of doing it manually, you have the control knobs down here. But if you decide that's way too complicated, we have the control box up here, and you can program it just to do it for you. Or you can use a mix match control, which you would do for finishings and to get specific. students because our lab we can have any major as long as you go to UCF you're allowed to use any of our tools and uh, actually show you how to use a lot of different things the newest thing that a lot of senior design and aerospace engineering kids like to use cutter. the foam cutter is basically a very simple way to get foam Slice in very specific um, airfoil templates, and you could do almost any template that is made. And all you would do after is you would assemble a wing, which if you follow me, I can show you a fully assembled wing. And it was actually functional. This was from one of our senior design groups. It's right here. This is actually with carbon fiber. Very, very large and heavy, I do see <laughs> But you can see how this is without strict of all its electronical components. We can see how the wing was designed and how it would have a servo here to control the wings going up and down. And then if I turn it, you'd actually be able to see the metal work where the body of the plane would be connected. And you can also see that it was laser. It was also foam cut, not laser cut, into the shapes it needs. If you look right up there, there is also another fully assembled plane just without the wings because it did not fit. And I laugh at the time. So what would you guys say is your favorite part of all of these different labs? Um, I like how they're open to students, so uh, not just engineering students, but really any student can come in, they can say, hey, can you guys help me with this? And uh, students would be allowed to be able to come and sit with you and work with you and say, okay, this is how you do this, and you do that, and kind of walk you through the process. So it's first time inventors, it's first time innovators can help you through the doing. I'm very biased, I love this lab, so. Um, but it's, more, it's all about creativity. If you want to make a really cool gift for your mom, your family, your friend, and you have an idea and you just don't know where to start, you want to make a light box that glows, you want to make a mirror with a computer in it, very on-trend things that you can find on YouTube, but they don't always tell you all the steps and things. So like, it's all about creativity, and there's a bunch of people here to help you with that. If I've had to help students stumble with their, like, school projects, but I've helped them create robots that they just wanted to create. It's all about the creativity. If you have an idea, we can find some you so want to help with that. Whether it, it is a student color and technician, or is it if it's a professor that we can get in touch with. It's all about creativity and basically building a community. It's not just engineering kids in here. It's architecture kids, it's graphics kids, it's science, 
majors, it's business majors, it's everyone. So it's really just a big community in here, and you can always find different creativities. And I've seen a lot of people who make businesses and start businesses. Um, a past coworker who was starting a business of electronic skateboards, so that was pretty cool. That is actually all the time we have for this segment. Thank you guys so much for showing us around. Uh, so with that, we are actually going to throw it over to Trevor Colburn Hall. So thank you guys for sticking around and checking out some things that we have to offer here in the College of Engineering. All right, welcome to our next on-campus location. I'm standing right in front of Trevor Colburn Hall, which is one of our newest academic and office buildings on campus. It is home to a lot of different departments here at UCF, including some honors college classes, primarily a College of Arts and Humanities, but also undergraduate studies and student development and enrollment services. So it's actually named after Dr. Trevor Colburn, who served as UCF's second president from 1978 to 1989. And around in this area, you can see some of our other buildings, including the Burnett Allardyce College, the Visual Arts, um, also our Performing Arts Complex. So. Also, you can see the gorgeous weather here in Orlando today. Um, I'm absolutely loving it. I'm from out of state, so this weather here in Orlando is always fantastic. So let's take a look inside. study location will see the way as well. Okay, so here we are at Knight's Major Exploration and Transition Services. So if you come into UCF as an undeclared major or undecided, or you're just looking to explore your options, this is a great advising office for you. You can meet with one of our academic professional advisors, or you can meet with one of our peer coaches to explore all of our major options and find one that is perfect for you and aligns with your interests and passions. So what they do here is they're going to pair you up with an academic advisor and whatever majors you're interested in looking into so you can learn more about your options. And they're also going to work closely with career services to make sure that you know about all of the career paths that align with each major here at UCF. It's totally okay and very common for students to come in as undeclared or undecided. In fact, 75% of students nationally um, change their major during their time as an undergraduate student. So this is a great resource for every student here at UCF and definitely something to look into. And just so you know, academic advising as well as scheduling for summer and fall classes takes place during your freshman orientation um, when you do that orientation program. Okay, now we're going to walk just around the corner and talk about our SARC Center. So while we're walking, SARC stands for Student Academic Resource Center. So basically they have a lot of academic resources for our students including tutoring, with it, whether it's a one-on-one peer -on -one, tutoring or tutoring as well, um, and some of other resources as well. So, so their mission is SARC, um, and basically they include peer tutoring for 30 different courses and supplemental instruction or SI for 31 courses. They have academic coaching under the um, ACE program where peer academic coaches will help students with things like time management, online learning, study skills, motivation, and more just kind of things to help you succeed in college in general. SARC graduates also facilitate a series of academic success workshops each semester on various topics such as goal setting, time management, and preparing for final exams. Also, a great feature of SARC is our study union. Basically, this is every fall and spring semester. Um, they'll provide final exam review sessions to students for pretty much every class under the sun. Generally, they're more popular with our STEM classes, but they do have others as well. Also, SARC hires student staff almost every semester. So this includes positions for tutors, SI leaders, academic coaches, and front desk workers. So the SARC website has the most accurate information. So if you want to learn some more, you can definitely check that out, including like things like schedules for tutoring, SI, and our series of academic workshops. So let's take a look around the rest of this building. To maximize space and a series of large suite, a series of large suites were designed on each floor. They have lots of natural light and open office areas. So for the areas in the building without windows, 
artificial sky domes bring in daylight to reduce ice rain and increase productivity. There are 10 classrooms total in Trevor Colburn Hall, as well as 19 study rooms. All of our classrooms feature mobile desks that can be configured in right or left hand orientation. Right here, you're gonna see one of those study rooms as I mentioned. They're great for private study and they're a nice quiet space for our students to get their work done. The main corridors in the building feature collaboration zones that encourage idea sharing and small group studying. There are big yellow ottomans scattered around that you'll see um, throughout the building along with charging stations and outlets and common spaces. So as a Spanish major, I have a lot of my classes in this building. And as you can see, it's all brand new. And this is a really great place to come and study in between classes or maybe before your class starts, um, or just to sit down after your class is done and get some homework done so you don't have to do it. All right, so sorry about the technical difficulties there for a second. We're back in Trevor Colburn Hall, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the University Writing Center. So basically, writing is an essential component to a lot of our majors here at UCF. Um, so we do have a writing center available for our students. Anyone can use it for free, and basically, um, all the lights are off right now, but I think um, they have a lot of different desks in there as well, um, with some chairs with wheels on them, and some and all that stuff. So definitely recommend checking out the University Writing Center for all of your writing song. So thank you guys for joining us today. Um, we really appreciate you coming back to talk to you. Also, right after this, we do have Zoom advertising.